Aloha and welcome to the second of two UH at Manoa Chancellor Search Forums. My name is Dave Carl and I currently serve as the co-chair of the Search Advisory Committee along with Emeritus Region James Lee and 18 additional distinguished committee members, many of whom are here today. We are very pleased to introduce Dr. Sonny Ramaswamy to the UH campus community. Following his prepared remarks, Dr. Ramaswamy will provide responses to questions from the audience that will hopefully convey his interest and passion for becoming the next CEO of this great campus. We invite you to participate in this forum both by asking key questions and by providing important feedback to the committee. The latter can be done most efficiently by use of the executive search web-based tool that has been created just to facilitate this purpose. All you need to do is to go to www.hawaii.edu slash executive search slash Manoa underscore chancellor and then fire away. We want to hear any and all comments and opinions that you may have, questions for the committee to pursue, and everything in between. And we would like your feedback by next week, Monday. That's the 28th of November, uh, because the committee is on a very tight timetable uh, to get information up to the president. Now it is my duty and great honor to introduce Dr. Sonny Ramaswamy. Dr. Ramaswamy earned his Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in entomology from the University of Agriculture Sciences in Bangalore, India, before moving to the United States to continue his education with support from a J.N. Tata Fellowship awarded from the Indian government and the Thomas Headley Fellowship awarded from Rutgers University. He earned his PhD in entomology from Rutgers in 1980. From New Brunswick, New Jersey, Dr. Ramaswamy spent two years as a postdoctoral research associate at the Michigan State University before accepting a faculty position at Mississippi State University where he rapidly moved up the academic ladder to the rank of full tenured professor of insect physiology in 1992. In 1997, Dr. Ramaswamy moved to Kansas State University to begin a series of progressively responsible leadership positions. At K-State, he served as the department head, then a few years later moved to Purdue University, where he served as the director of agriculture research and associate dean in the College of Agriculture. At Purdue, he was responsible for a budget in excess of $100 million dollars, for research in the areas of agriculture, food, and natural resources on the main campus at eight regional ag centers, as well as many campus-owned and operated research farms and woodlands. In August 2009, he moved to Oregon State University to become the Dean of the College of Agriculture Sciences and the Director of the Oregon Agriculture Experiment Station with a budget of over $125 million for the college's programs at the Corvallis campus, at the OSU Cascades campus in Bend, at 11 experimental stations throughout the state, and many other extension programs. Equally important, while at Oregon State University, he served as a member of the senior leadership team and participated in strategic planning and resource allocation for the campus as a whole. Then in May 2012, he was selected to become a senior official in the Obama administration with his appointment as director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture of the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. He currently manages a budget of $1.6 billion and a staff of approximately 400 permanent, temporary, and contract employees. He and his team are responsible for providing direction for broad national policies in the areas of food, agriculture, natural resources to meet present national needs and future challenges. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ramaswamy. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Carl, for uh, that uh, 
fine introduction. It's great to be here, and I really want to thank you and your co-chair, Mr. Lee, and the search committee itself for having decided on inviting me to come here and spend the uh, last couple of days here on campus. And uh, I've had the privilege of uh, having many, many conversations with a whole bunch of individuals, professors and staff and deans and uh, vice chancellors and, and a whole bunch of students as well. It's been really an eye-opening uh, set of conversations that I've had. And I really want to uh, also thank uh, my, my very last conversation was with the Kuali'i, I hope I pronounced that name right, council. And uh, really it was an eye-opening conversation for me. And I want to speak to that as well, the conversation that I had with that group, but you know, in general, the rest of the group as well. Dr. Carl here suggested that I ought to spend about uh, uh, you know, 20 to 30 minutes or so in making some uh, comments and then you know, open it up for uh, Q&A as well. Uh, I, I know, it, you know, also the, the council, by the way, gave me this beautiful uh, jasmine lay, and if my wife were here, uh, she would love it. She, this is her favorite flower in the whole entire world, and she's not here uh, this afternoon, but who knows, maybe we'll come back here, and maybe she'll get a lay as well uh, of uh, jasmine when we come back here. In any case, seriously, it, it really is great to be uh, here. And uh, so in the next few minutes, I want to share some thoughts with you about, uh, you know, I've been asked to share with you my vision for this institution as well. But in the, uh, in the long introduction that uh, Dr. Carl made here, he indicated along the way, I've been a professor, and the professors in the room here and online as well know that any good professor is going to start a class asking a question of the class. So I want to do the same thing here. I would like to ask you a question. I want to ask the question, what does the phrase new economy mean to you? Anybody? All right, if you don't volunteer, I'm going to call on you to answer the question, by the way, just like a professor does. <laughs> Carl, Dr. Carl, how about you? Knowledge-based <clears throat> economy. Knowledge economy and high-tech economy. How about somebody in the back? How about Ken Grace, who is a friend of mine from a long time ago? Okay, okay. Less labor, more mechanization. I sit to see next to him is Irene, uh, the university librarian. Did I get that right, Irene? Go ahead, Irene. Tell me, what do you think about new economy? Knowledge creation. Knowledge creation. Yes, indeed. All right, Denise, how about you in the front? Renewable energy, green power, and climate neutral. Wow. Renewable energy, green power, climate neutral. That's fantastic. Really, uh, really perfect. So, uh, you know, the words new economy, if we, were, if we were to go around here, we've got about, what, about 50 or 70 people sitting in the auditorium here, and hopefully that many online or more. If I were to ask each one of you, you'd probably come up with a particular definition, and we'd have a whole bunch of definitions, and all those would be true. The term new economy was invented, by the way, by Time magazine uh, back in 1983. And uh, they said at that time that America had morphed from a manufacturing economy into an information economy. And about uh, seven, eight, nine years ago or so, I started thinking about what kind of an economy do we have. And I co-opted that term into thinking what we do collectively uh, as, as educators, as scientists, as people that are deeply interested in protecting and sustaining our, you know, our, the, the one earth that we know over the long term. And uh, so there's a whole slew of them, one of which is population. It's definitely driving this new economy. In fact, you know, we're projected to be about 10 billion people or so in just a few years. Uh, but we already have challenges because of the 7.3 billion people that we've got on Earth. The challenges that we see uh, in regards to nutrition. On the one hand, we've got excessive amounts of nutrition. Uh, and so we have all these metabolic disorders and things like that. On the other hand, we've got lack of availability of food. So as a result of lack of availability of food, globally, tonight, 29,000 people are going to drop dead. And as a result of too much food, and of course in America we know something about that, we'll have 50,000 people that will drop dead because of metabolic disorders, in part contributed to by excess amounts of food. It's also about the demographics. Our demographics are changing. You know, Hawaii, you know, uh, epitomizes the demographics that we've got 
uh, in America. In fact, for the very first time, starting in the fall of uh, 2015, children that started going to school in the fall of 2015, children of color surpassed white children. Demographic changes, we're an aging population. And luckily we're not as bad as China or Japan or Korea, but America certainly is an aging population. And uh, lucky for us, we've got these new immigrants that are coming in that bring that, that influx of young people coming in that's going to continue to help drive the systems that we've got. The issues pertaining to robotics and automation are, are part of this new economy as well. In fact, because of robotics and automation, what used to take 10 people to work just five years ago in the good old days, five years ago, what used to take 10 people, today takes one person. Look at what's happening to Amazon and other enterprises. Amazon.com now is gonna be surpassing Walmart in being a purveyor. They need very few people to actually move things around, and they don't need as many. And you know, during the elections, we had a seismic event here a couple of weeks ago, and the, our president-elect tapped into that despair, into that angst that we've got as a result of this new economy as well. We've also got uh, white people in America, between 25 and 55, white males and females, are committing suicide at a very high level because of this despair, of the lack of jobs, and these jobs that are lost because of automation and robotics and things like that. And, you know, you can go on and on and on about these things. You know, we're morphing from a petroleum economy. I think we're tantalizingly close to this bioeconomy. Just last week, Monday, an airplane flew from Seattle, Washington, to Washington, D.C., Reagan National Airport. My boss, Secretary Tom Vilsack, was there to receive that airplane. And the airplane was flown, get this, on wood chips. They took wood chips and slash piles, converted that into jet fuel, poured it into that airplane and that airplane flew. The possibilities of that new economy for this institution, for this state, for the young people that this institution is educating are mind-boggling. How do we, you and I, collectively as educators, as discoverers of new knowledge, as inventors, how do we ensure that we're supporting this enterprise of these young people? This aspirational goal that inst this institution has of being a place of distinction for Native Hawaiians at this institution, and as being one that is about sustainability over the long term. We gotta think about this, because this new economy is driving everything that we do. It is having an impact on decisions being made globally as well. That's something that we've gotta think of. All right, I wanna morph a little bit. <clears throat> the University of Hawaii, Manoa, is a uh, land-grant university. Our DNA, come from Justin Smith Morrill. And I like to say, I'd like to uh, state that this institution to me epitomizes what I call as you undertake user-inspired work, whether it's the education that you offer or the discoveries that you make or the inventions that you make, is inspired by the end user. And then that is translated into innovations and solutions and delivered back to those end users and it transforms lives. There's a number of examples of that. It is those 3,000 young Native Hawaiian students that are here on this campus. Their lives are being transformed. It is the work that's being done on homelessness by faculty at this institution. It's the work being done on understanding how methane is produced in the oceans that we can figure out how to mitigate its impact on climate change. And, and the potential for having a catastrophic in, uh, impact on us. It is the work of uh, addressing mesothelioma that's transformative. It is the work of figuring out that corn silk has flavones in it that can address Alzheimer's disease. This is pretty cool stuff that's going on at this institution. This is all about, it's inspired by the end users and it's gonna have this impact that transforms people's lives as well. And that's what, to me, this institution epitomizes. I've been asked this question multiple times. Why am I interested in this institution in this particular position? It is this, the statement that I made about user-inspired and transforming lives. That's the epitome of uh, the University of Hawaii as a land-grant university. That's what turns me on, number one. Number two, and, and number one, going back to the land-grant university itself. 
When Justin Smith Morrill got the act passed and Abraham Lincoln signed it into law in 1862, it was done to offer educational opportunities for the dispossessed, for the disempowered, for the poor. And this is a people's college, said Abraham Lincoln. And that's what this is. It is about offering opportunities to young people. It doesn't matter where they come from. And, and really, a tip of my hat to your institution for the kind of work that you're doing in creating this inclusive environment. Yeah, there's more work to do, but you're headed in the right path as well, you know, which is fantastic. And along with that, is in looking at the profile of this institution that I've shared with multiple individuals with the committee and, and other individuals as well. Number one is the research, research profile that you exhibit as an institution. I dare say you're probably one of the best there is in America, and, but I'd only give you a B plus because there are pockets of excellence in multiple units within the university there's a great opportunity for the others to step up their game as well. And I had a great conversation with Michael Bruno and, and Vasilis Sirmos as well earlier about these opportunities that we've got. And along with that is the graduate education. Uh, you know, about a quarter of the students here are undertaking graduate studies. That's pretty fantastic if you compare the University of Hawaii, Manoa, with your peers or your benchmark institutions, they're right around about 10 to 15 percent of their uh, students or graduate students. So you're sitting at a pretty good spot with about 400 odd doctoral students that are graduating uh, each year or more for that matter. So I'd you know, say that I shared with several people that I'd give, it, give this institution an A for that effort. And last but not least is the undergraduate education. In fact, I shared this with the students that came and met with me. The core of our being, uh, I use the French term raison d'etre. The raison d'etre of our being are the students. Without the students, without those end users for whom you're developing new knowledge, we shouldn't be here. And I think you're doing a phenomenal job in multiple areas except in the undergraduate education. Turns out we've got graduation rates at this institution that is about, uh, uh, for you know, four-year graduation rates, about 30-odd percent. Six-year graduation rates, about 55-odd percent. And I think personally, and I, a lot of you agree with me, I know this, you do, every one of you probably, I think there's something bad wrong with this picture. It is really incumbent on us collectively to figure out a path on how we make sure the promise we make is that every student that comes here gets an education in a reasonable period of time, no more than six years, preferably four years. And they go leave with the least amount of indebtedness because every year we add, if you're an in-state student, you're adding an additional $25,000 per year. If you're an out-of-state student, you're adding $50,000 per year. And you know in America, the two fastest growing uh, segments of our economy are the Tuition and health care. And actually, tuition is going at a faster clip than health care itself because the Affordable Care Act has actually pushed that slope down a little bit. So it's really incumbent on us to make sure that we're going to provide the education, the opportunities, and get our students graduated on time. So that's the reason why I was really turned on, as I shared with several people sitting here in this audience, that... I was really intrigued when I got the, the uh, call, email, and, and then call with uh, Dr. Carl here. To ask, he asked me to throw my hat in the ring. That, and in looking at the profile, I thought, oh, wow, this is really an amazing place to be. And I've got certain skills. I've got the academic background at multiple institutions, as you heard uh, in Dr. Carl's introduction. I know how to raise money. I know how to set a goal of achieving preeminence. And I've had the federal in the Washington, D.C. experience as well, which is the federal ecosystem drives much of the discovery process and the educational process that you all are involved in as well. So I have a, a deep knowledge of that. But aside from that, the question that, you know, that, that one of the things that I'd like to ask collectively we should be doing is aspiring to greatness. In, a, in, a, in addressing the undergraduate retention slash graduation rates, 
We're already sitting in a pretty good spot in the research enterprise, the graduate education enterprise. We've got to up the game. But really, it's the undergraduate education. If we were to be able to do that, I bet you we can aspire to becoming an AAU, an American Association of Universities institution. Our benchmark institutions, whether it's the University of California, Davis, or the University of California, San Diego, or other institutions, they're all AAU universities. It's not that I want to be number one or in the top five or top ten or whatever. It is about aspiring to a greater level of endeavor to reach that preeminence. We want to be the absolute best there. I want to help you achieve that to get there. How do we get there? Right. Very specifically, talk a little bit about the, uh, the undergraduate education piece of it. And during the questions and answers, you know, hopefully you'll ask me questions about the grant environment, the fundraising environment, and things like that. I've had you know, really good knowledge and skills in all of those, demonstrable experiences in all of those as well. Talk very specifically about the, the uh, undergraduate education. Okay. This institution, collectively at the system level as well at, at the university level, has this aspiration to be an institution of distinction, as I said earlier, for indigenous students. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we doing enough to get to that point? Maybe we've done some, but are we where we want to be? What is that where we want to be in regards to our indigenous students and faculty? The second one, of course, is sustainability. What does sustainability mean? What should we be doing? I see signs on the doors here saying that this building is, uh, you know, doing everything it can about energy and things like that. But sustainability is a lot more beyond all of those things as well. In, in the way we treat our young people, in the way we treat each other, in the way we work with our colleagues, uh, in the way we create an environment that helps everybody achieve their dreams and things like that. That's what sustainability is. Yeah, there's some other metrics that we can think of as well from an environmental perspective, from an economic perspective and things like that too. And then if you sort of drill down from that aspiration of distinction for indigenous students and sustainability, you drill down. Uh, there's multiple goals that this institution has articulated and it can be summarized uh, you know, quite easily in what the system has uh, done as well. Number one is about, it's the, the Hawaii graduation initiative. The second one is the innovation uh, initiative. The third one is 21st century facilities. And last but not least is having the high performance mission driven systems in place as well. And so I'll you know, sort of take a little di deeper dive into each one of those a little bit. All right, the first one in regards to the graduation initiative itself. Um, I've been, you know, for many, many years now, I've been deeply interested in looking at America, the fact that on average across America, all the land-grant universities and public universities, on average, we're only graduating one out of two uh, students. That means we're losing, in six years, by the way, we're losing half the students that are coming in. We talk about, oh, pipeline, we've got to increase the pipeline, we've got to get more students. Well, we've got to work to make sure we're graduating students that are already here on time to leave, to finish up, and have the skills and knowledge necessary to be able to do great things, to contribute to society itself. And so in thinking about this, looking at the landscape of all the great universities that are doing some amazing things in, in regards to graduation, whether it is Virginia Commonwealth University or Johns Hopkins University or University of Michigan or University of Wisconsin or Purdue University or Clemson University, by the way, Clemson University, I shared this with some of the folks that I had conversations with. Clemson and the University of Hawaii Manoa were at the same level about 10 years ago. About 15 to 17% graduation for four-year graduation rates, about uh, 48 to 52% for six-year graduation rates. Both institutions set their minds to increasing their graduation rates. Clemson is at about 54% four-year graduation rate and about 80% six-year graduation rates. This institution is sitting, as I said earlier, at about 32% and 55, 58% or so. So what is it that Clemson has done? What is it that Virginia Commonwealth University has done? They're really paying attention. Not that you're not paying attention, but here's something for you to think of, some food for thought. Uh, I came up with a mnemonic for myself. I've shared this as well with several of you. I shared as well 
Like, it's like the Paul Harvey ending of, you're going to have to wait for the rest of the story. Some of you are waiting for the rest of the story. And uh, this is very simply the mnemonic for myself is A, B, C, D, E, F. The six letters. A, shared with several of you, is advising and attendance. Virginia Commonwealth University has done an amazing job of intrusive advising. They're really working very hard. They don't have a situation where a student comes to you, you hand that student a program of study that says, go do 128 credit hours, I'll never see you again for the next four or six or whatever. You don't even know if the student's around or not. And what Virginia Commonwealth and other institutions have done that have this very high 95% graduation level at, in Wisconsin and Michigan, what they have is making sure that the students are attending. If you're not attending, something's wrong. You know, maybe they're sick. Maybe their parents are sick. Maybe something went bad. Maybe they have a wreck. We gotta keep track of our, our students that come here. They're our family. Make sure that we're working on this. A. B is behavior. There's way too many opportunities, particularly this location we're at, in regards to the surf, in regards to the drugs, in regards to the alcohol, and the culture that, you know, of, of you know, college campuses and things like that, sexual violence, all of these are part of the behaviors, and we got to keep track of these things. Make sure that we're paying attention as, as people that are interested in the well-being of young people that come here, because their parents have vested that trust in us to make sure that those young people are going to be protected. The C is courses. I met with students yesterday, and one student said to me, well, I can't get a particular course that I need, and I won't be able to graduate on time. That's unconscionable. How can that be? We got to make sure that we offer courses properly timed, properly scheduled. And if we can't have that course here, how about we copy what the Consortium for Institutional Cooperation has done in the Big Ten area? So if Purdue does not have a Bengali teaching professor, they can go to the University of Wisconsin and access that. How about we do something like that for that young lady that couldn't have that particular course? We got to pay attention to these things. Courses need to be offered in sequence, on time, so that students can finish up. In fact, the University of Buffalo has a four-year guarantee. And uh, Lori uh, Ideta said to me uh, earlier today that there is the Manoa promise, not unlike the Buffalo promise. If you, based on this, 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 if you don't get a degree in four years, Buffalo will cover the cost of your finishing up. That's the promise that we've got to make, that students, when they come here, they get the education, good time, and oh, by the way, they've got the skills and the knowledge to be able to get good jobs as well. Really, we've got to think of that connectivity between the education. It's not something for my resume or for me to pat on myself on the shoulder that I got 50 students that graduated or whatever. Really, are we endowing them with the skills and knowledge as well? The letter D is data. Now, we got to be able to measure. I met with uh, uh, various faculty groups and others. One of the challenges is having access to good data. And what does data mean anyway? You know, as somebody once said that it's like the definition of pornography. You know it when you see it. And uh, really, we got to define what those data needs are. we got to use data. And in fact, there's a number of companies that offer this. Johns Hopkins is one of the premier institutions for data-driven uh, work with undergraduate students. And uh, uh, Michael uh, Bruno was telling me this morning that you have uh, taken up uh, grades first as an approach to doing this, and that the athletics department students have been piloted, and some other colleges are now going to pick that up as well. It's a great path forward of keeping track of what's going on, because really we've got to keep track of uh, our, our young people, as I've kept saying over and over again. The letter E is for experiential education. Again, going back to the DNA where we come from, the land-grant DNA. As I've said many times, three things need to happen. Foundational knowledge for everybody, doesn't matter what you're studying, in the liberal arts and humanities and sciences. That's foundational for everybody. We've got a bunch of Europeans sitting in the front, Euro, Europeans sitting in the front here, Gunther. He'll tell you the kind of education that he received uh, back in Germany, I assume you're from Germany, Gunther, yeah. You focus on that part of it. And built on top of it is practical education in the agriculture and mechanic arts, A&M. But practical education, experiential education is what we call it now. 
for everybody, whether you're a student in English or sociology or physics or chemistry or entomology or whatever it is that you do, you got to have those. we got to figure out how best to make that. Not a research enterprise, an amazing research enterprise is a fantastic entree for us to create that. There's no conflict between undergraduate education and this research one enterprise that we've got. We've got to figure out how best to make both of them come to fruition as well. So experiential education. Now, oh, by, by the way, last but not least of the Moral Act is leadership, uh, military leadership. Not so much learning how to shoot guns as much as critical thinking, problem solving, communication skills, and things like that. That's the whole of you know, professionalism and ethics and things. How about we incorporate that sort of an educational enterprise for our undergraduate students? About every student has to have that experiential education. And last but not least is F for financing. It takes money. Again, Lori Ideta was telling me this morning that in their, your, your own research here, number one reason why students are dropping off the radar is money. And we collectively have to roll up our sleeves. You want to hire a, a chancellor that's going to work really hard to get the resources needed, whether it's from the donors or from the research enterprise or from the state legislature. Work very closely with uh, uh, the, the president of the system, David Lasner, and the Board of Regents to create a path with the faculty and the staff and the students to create this path on how we go about raising this additional resources that we need. We absolutely must have that, particularly if we continue to say we're going to be an institution of distinction for uh, indigenous students. That takes money. It takes a commitment. We all have to make that commitment. We've made a commitment, but we're not making the kind of resources that are needed as well for these enterprises. So A, B, C, D, E, F is the graduation initiative. A couple of quick things about the innovation uh, initiative and the high performance uh, uh, mission and the 21st century facilities. I'll, you know, it'll come up in the questions and Q&A session as well. A little bit about the 21st century facilities. Uh, this institution, like a lot of land-grant universities across America, and I know land-grants really, really well because I'm privileged. I've had the, uh, the opportunity to travel to every state in the union, and I've had a chance to look at the facilities. And as a result of that, five years ago, we started a conversation to create, we need money for this. Again, it's, it comes down to money. States have walked away from investing in maintenance. Deferred maintenance here is about $400 million. And then you multiply it across America, it ends up being about, 80 billion, about 60 to $80 billion. Pretty significant chunk of change, that is. And in this environment, remember, it's all about cutting budgets. But your own senator, Senator uh, Maisie Hirono, her staff has worked with us to develop an effort to get a, a bill passed that has several people that have signed on to it. We hope that Republicans will sign on to it as well. And the best part is that uh, uh, our president-elect, our president-to-be very soon, contrary to what we're all thinking, he is our president, um, has said he wants to invest in innovations. Pardon me, in uh, infrastructure, as well as innovations. Infrastructure, one trillion dollars. And what I hope can happen with the effort being undertaken by Senator Hirono from here, and she's got a number of people from around America that are signing on to it. I'm hoping 0.1% of that can be for the academic enterprises. One billion dollars a year, that's all I ask for, for us collectively to get. So then you can go ahead and get a match from donors, from states, from other sources, and hopefully create a path to address this deferred maintenance. This is going to eat us alive. And we're undertaking 21st century science in buildings, and I'm going to generalize across America, in 19th and 20th century, century buildings. That's what we're doing. Oh, by the way, many of you have traveled to China and Brazil and other places. Unbelievable. In fact, at one of the uh, hearings that I had on with Congress, I was asked the question about this situation. I said, uh, Congressman Farr from California, I said, Congressman Farr, in the good old days, five years ago, in the year 2010, if you're a genomicist, you wanted to do genomics, you went to the JGI, the Joint Genome Institute. David here would know something a little bit about that. 
Fast forward to the year 2015 when I had my hearing. I said, fast forward now. If you want to do genomics, you go to BGI, Beijing Genomics Institute. Oh, by the way, the equipment that is used in Beijing, the software that's used in Beijing, is the creative output of people like yourself across America. But you cannot afford to buy that equipment. You cannot afford to house that because we just don't have a way to provide the funding. The states have walked away from it. So I'd like for us to work together to get the federal government and the state government to come up with a way to address this infrastructure issue that we've got. So part of it from the federal government, part of it from the state government, and certainly part of it from various donors and such. So were I to, you know, um, and I can you know, go on and on about these other things as well. There's been some conversation here on campus about the budget and how, who makes decisions, how do you allocate these things. And really what people are asking for is not uh, us against them or any such thing. Everybody has a legitimate right to know what's happening. People really dislike being kept in the dark, and that's all it is, greater awareness. And Kathy and I had a wonderful conversation about that too this morning. Greater awareness, that's not a whole lot to ask. So transparency, accountability, equitability are really, really important for all of us. I'd like to know what's happening. Uh, every one of you sitting in this auditorium, every one of the students and faculty on this campus would like to know what's happening. And really, keeping people aware of what's going on is all that they're asking for. Not that they want to dive into every little detail of every little penny that as to where it's going, what's happening with it, et cetera, et cetera. Because these you know, professors and others are very busy doing what they are best here for, which is to educate, which is to discover, to invent, and things like that. So I think it's really incumbent on us to make sure. So, so to, to wrap up here, you know, where I do you know, come here, oh, one last thing I want to share as well. I met Nick our football coach, sitting right there, Nick. And I had the privilege of uh, having a conversation with uh, uh, Dave Matlin yesterday in the morning as well. And uh, uh, there's been a conversation here, well, is athletics important? No, it's not, you know, it's all about academics. You know, we create this environment of us against them, it's an either or sort of an environment. Look at our benchmark institutions, our aspirational peers. University of Michigan has the number two ranked football team, I think, this week, if I'm not mistaken, and the most outstanding educational enterprise as well. So how do we get to that? This athletics program is synergistic to the academic program and vice versa. Rather than saying them and us, we gotta figure out, create the environment where people enjoy it, students and the faculty, everybody enjoys it. Some universities have figured out how to wean the athletics program from uh, you know, tuition money going to it. Maybe there's a path forward for us as well here. But how about we collectively, I challenged the students, I said, students, you gotta show up at those games, right? All of you, the 13,000, 19,000 students, 17,000, whatever, yeah, 17,000 students, show up at the game. Make a lot of noise, inspire those players to achieve great things, win those ball games, and that results in greater level of recognition by our donors and our alumni and such as well. That's what's gonna happen. Our legislators are gonna recognize what we do. And then, oh, by the way, we're gonna celebrate the, the David Carls and the Edward DeLongs and, and all the others that we've got here as well. We're gonna celebrate the academic enterprise and we're gonna celebrate the athletic enterprise and bring those two together to really help us get to a, a much significantly higher spot as well. So I wanna you know, go ahead and see David has gotten up already. Thanks very much for giving me a few minutes to share some thoughts with you. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm ready and available to respond to your questions and mahalo, thanks very much. very interested in our next leader to ask uh, questions of you, so thank you for agreeing to that. Uh, the campus visit continues after this event, so we may have a few minutes after beyond 4.30, but not much because uh, Dr. Ramaswamy still has several appointments. Uh, we're recording this, so when you get up, please project so that we can get the uh, question on uh, videotape. And uh, the more succinct the question, the more succinct the answer. So Thank you. First. Thanks for the reminder. The, uh, right there. Uh, my question has to can you tell me who you are, please? My name is Susan Schultz. I'm in the English department. 
and I'm founder of the Compassion Hui on campus. Uh, my question has to do with B behavior, R retention, and T transparency. Um, as you probably know, uh, studies have shown that there are huge spikes nationwide in anxiety, especially depression and suicide. Mm -hmm. This campus does have a counseling center, but it's overwhelmed mm -hmm. and underfunded and understaffed. Mm -hmm. We do not have transparency and communication from administration about tragedies on campus or the resources that are already here. Mm. So my question is, what would you do about the B? Yeah. Oh, wow. Susan from the English department asked the question, the letter B that I referred to, behaviors. And we have young people on this campus committing suicide. We've got a counseling center that does not have enough resources and there's not enough communication, conversations on mm -hmm. campus. The question is, what would I do? We gotta fix that. That's a no-brainer. The more we engage in conversations, the better off we all are. You can't hide these things, really. It is important to have these conversations. So, you know, as I shared with many individuals, I don't have a lot of answers, but I have a lot of questions. And my style has always been, I'm gonna come in, uh, ask lots and lots of questions of various individuals that are vested with these responsibilities, the counseling center and other parts, and also our budget office. Uh, you know, what are we doing? Why aren't we resourcing units that are critically important, particularly if we've got these spikes going on during certain events and things like that? We've got to be very thoughtful about it. So that's, that's really no-brainer. Absolutely, I agree with you. We've got to fix it. David Chen, Information from Computer Sciences. I wanted to ask you what you would think of having a uh, RCM responsibility center model for our budget. Yeah, yeah, David Chen from uh, Computer Science. Okay, uh, Information Systems, I think you said, right? Yeah. So the question uh, from uh, David is what do I think of the RCM model? I'm going to give you, uh, you know, a very short, succinct statement and I'll give you a little context as well. I don't think it's a great model, it doesn't work very well. Um, the guy, one of the guys that was in, in, involved in inventing it, his name is Ed Ray. He's the president at uh, Oregon State University. He used to be at the Ohio State University about 20 years ago. And he and a few others figured out RCM model, thinking that it would be a great way to move from the incremental budgets and whatever else models that we've had. At that time, it was all about incremental budgets, you know? Uh, or basically a zero-sum game is what it used to be. And it turns out the system can lend itself to, for example, turf protection on the one hand. Number two, it could result in gaming the system. So let's say that uh, I'm, in the, uh, I'm in the physics program and I need my students to you know, take some English courses or whatever. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start building these things. Of course, we've got you know, checks and balances, the faculty senate that votes on these things can indeed go ahead and, and you know, figure out how best to do it. I think rather than saying RCM model or this model or whatever, the models that are, that are working, several institutions, many institutions are struggling with this. And I know where you're coming from, you know, as, as, a, as a faculty member, you know, units that are producing a lot of student credit hours, why shouldn't they be sharing in or keeping the money? How do you pay for the computational systems that we need, the data systems that we need, the counseling systems that we need, the library that we need, et cetera, or the uh, indigenous students that we need to support as well? And so we got to figure out a, a model that works for us. And I think, you know, some institutions have developed this, and I know this personally because I was at Oregon State University where we developed this, you know, hybrid model. So it takes into account the the R, he quotes the RCM model, which is very simply, by the way, the money stays, stays where it's been generated. And then you may come up with a way to tax that a little bit to move it around to pay for central services and things like that. So the hybrid model is really that plus a uh, performance based plus an incremental budget. So really, there's a way, you shouldn't be a contentious conversation. Let's grow our sleeves up, figure out for us, this context right here, what works best. Let's do it rather than saying, well, this works or that works. 
you know, you might say, I want only RCM, and I say, well, you know, I don't know, it doesn't really, really work, et cetera. But I think collectively, you and I can bring to the table some really, really interesting possibilities. Let's figure out what the outcomes are that we want to achieve. I'm very outcomes driven, very evidence driven. So let's figure out what those outcomes are and work towards it. Go back there, sir. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> always known uh, President Obama was here exactly three months ago. Uh, for the opening of the WCC, IUCN, the World uh, Conservation, International Union for the uh, Conservation of, of Nature, the people who want to stop uh, killing elephants for ivory or yeah. whales, you know, and all that stuff. And and that I would suggest to you, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy, that that is part of the reason why you are one of our two finalists, in that you are reflective of a strategy of our power elite, which is, has been very well known for, for its strategic syntax, right? Uh, I think you, and that set up point leads me to my, my, my question and your present job and its relation to your moving into the chancellor's office in Hawaii all uh, across the uh, mall there uh, next year. And the question is, what is your uh, professional opinion of the future of fish farming as an industry, in particular, to Hawaii, the only state of the 50 members of the union that's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and the Pacific Century. Oh, wow. That's a great question. <laughs> so the comment made, for those of you that are online, uh, the first you know, statement made is that President Obama was here uh, in Hawaii uh, about three months ago. and. Uh, uh, you know, was here for the International Conference on Conservation. And, and the question following that up is, you know, were I to come here as the Chancellor, uh, what's my, you know, based on my affiliation uh, and, and, and heading the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and being in the Obama administration as one of the officials there, what is my take on fish farming, right? And so, I would suggest that we shouldn't a priori say, no, we're not going to do this or not do that. We've got to figure out how are we going to go ahead and help support the economic needs of communities that we, we have a requirement, a responsibility as a land grant university to support that. Okay. So if indeed there is a community-based community, not David Carl and I going down and saying, well, thou shalt do thus and such. It needs to be from the bottom up, if there's an interest in it. What we've got to do is to deploy the best minds of the David Carls of this institution to undertake the work that needs to be done and understanding, if you were to do this, what are the intended and what are the unintended consequences? We've got to do that. Before you just say, okay, we're gonna do it willy-nilly, not knowing what the unintended consequences can be. So, I'd say, but we've got the horsepower here. If we don't have the horsepower, we need to go ahead and engage with that horsepower as well. To, and, and by the way, many, many countries across the world are struggling through this as well. Should we or shouldn't we do it? And, and for me, really, truly, uh, I shared this with many of people. I grew up in a you know, family that was pretty poor in India. And uh, there are a lot of poor people across the globe, a lot of poor people here in this state. Many of them are people of color. Many of them are indigenous peoples. How do we figure out how to create economic opportunities? So that's the approach that I'll end up taking. Yeah? Yeah, please. Move Shane from admissions. Uh, I, you know, I completely agree that we're very diverse and we need to get a lot more opportunity to create academics. Not being able to attend class you know, during traditional times, you know, we really need economy, a space economy. And so, having worked at a private institution before I came here, we specialized in having courses and many programs offered tonight. Mm -hmm. Would you be in support or as chance to uh, push to have more opportunities for those students mm -hmm. who can only attend at night, mm -hmm. and only work towards a bachelor's? or a master's or a PhD. Yeah, well, Shane uh, from admissions asked the question is if I would be supportive 
of working with non-traditional students, I frame it from that perspective, Shane, if you don't mind, that can attend classes uh, between, what, nine and four or something like that on weekdays. And how do we go ahead and capture that segment of our society? Because of various reasons, because we may, maybe they gotta work to uh, you know, support their family or whatever else it is. So you come with some very significant skills and knowledge. So one of the first things that I'd ask you is, I shared this with some of the people, if I were to come here, if you come to me with a problem, I want to say, tell me what the solution is, because we're going to work with it collectively. So what I'd expect that you do is the Vice uh, Provost, uh, Vice uh, Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and you and the others that have knowledge and an interest in this, I say, find out, how many of these students are we talking about? How many are we missing out on? Are there an opportunity to work with the folks on the various uh, military bases that we've got here? and create that environment to be able to offer that. And I think we should do it, absolutely. Our physical facilities here, as in other institutions, is really underutilized. We're only utilizing across America about 60% of our physical facilities. There's a lot of facilities that are sitting around, lights are on, electricity is running, heat is running, et cetera. How about we capitalize on bringing in students in that time as well? That's one thing to think of. The second thing to think of is, I like to think of doing a click and brick approach as well. If you're going to come here, you know, a brick building, you're going to learn how to, uh, you know, develop knowledge and things like that. But also, anytime, any place learning, we really got to push that very hard. Yeah, there is a, uh, I met with Bill, I forget his last name, the dean of the outreach uh, uh, school. And how about we, you know, enhance the, uh, uh, our online presence and, and create that environment of click and brick. They're sometimes here, sometimes at home, or wherever they are. They're able to study and access that information. Again, going back to the CIC, the Consortium on Institutes of Cooperation in the Big Ten. They, they really use technology where we can have somebody sitting in their home, let's say studying to be studying molecular biology, and they need to do a practical approach. You can have an on-campus professor or somebody that can help proctor it if they, we can develop those sorts of things as well. A number of institutions have stepped up, and particularly non-traditional students are truly a missed opportunity to go in a war time. So I'd ask you to help figure out a path forward since you seem to have some experience with it. Mm -hmm. Marina Zaleski, Human Nutrition, Food, and Animal Sciences. I would like you to explain your vision for shared governance. Uh -huh. Yes. Anita asked the question, what's my vision for shared governance? <clears throat> My vision is we're all on the same side, and we got to share, we got to be transparent, as I said earlier. Everybody's going to have to be aware of what's going on. The decisions that we make should not be something that's sprung on people. Nobody likes to be surprised or blindsided. People want to be involved in this. This is our institution. And if it is our institution, we're all on the same side, we're not trying to achieve the same goals. And again, as I just said to, uh, Dr. Chen here in the front, I'm very outcomes driven. Let's figure out what those outcomes are and figure out how best to get there. It's a shared responsibility that we've got. So shared governance is shared responsibility and shared outcomes. Yeah. A lot of your suggestions involve the faculty doing more. How would you encourage and reward the faculty for stepping up? Yeah, wow. <laughs> and what's your name? David Duffy. Okay, David Duffy and Botany. Okay, Dr. Duffy and Botany, David Duffy, asked the question, all the things that I've said, or a lot of the things, modified a little bit, will require more work to be done. And absolutely, no doubt about it. And uh, so how do we, you know, if your plate is already full, how do you go ahead and say, okay, I want to take this on as well? It's not that, you know, we're, we, I'd, I wouldn't want to come in and say, okay, you know, David, you're going to just take this on in addition to your day job that you've got, you know, do non traditional students at night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I shared this with, uh, with Lori as well earlier, Ideta. Uh, I said that somebody once said, that uh, a WAG once said, uh, a great vision without the resources becomes a nightmare. And I certainly do not want to create an environment of, uh, of a nightmare. I'd like for us to go in eyes wide open, work on it. We can't do all things for all people at all times. There are decisions that you and I have to make. 
And, and the only way, and, and I've done that demonstrably, you can go talk to my former colleagues at Oregon State University if you so desired. And uh, is that shared, the word shared governance was used. There's a shared vision that you and I have to go ahead and collectively develop as well. And, and work towards achieving it. And if it requires resources, both monetary and uh, human resources, that's why I say, if you want to do a strategic path that you want to create, you want to have a very well thought out business plan that goes with it as well. If you don't do it, don't do it. Don't embark on it. Yeah. Wow, Heather, thanks so much for that uh, question. She's a graduate student in, uh, in social psychology. Correct. Yeah, social psychology. The question is, what would be the unique challenges I, Sonny, would face uh, as opposed to my counterparts across the continental United States? I think there are, I'm going to frame it a little bit differently for you, right? I'm the half full guy. I'm the eternal optimist. And uh, so there are unbelievable opportunities here. That's the reason why I wanted to throw my hat in the ring. And I'm glad I did, because I've learned a lot in, in addition to my little superficial analysis that I did. It's an amazing place to come to. So incredible opportunities that we've got as well. So the challenges are going to be unique to this as, as a, an island and you know, attracting and retaining staff and students and getting them the resources that they need to continue on. By the way, you know, we all think, oh my gosh, you know, Hawaii, the University of Hawaii, Manawa has, you know, serious budget problems and things like that. Yes, but you know, in many ways, the budget situation here is much better than most other institutions. Tim Sands, the president of Virginia Tech, was just told that he's going to have to give up 7.8% of his funding. Yeah, that's happening all over America. Here, 38% of the budget, I think 38% is right, comes from the state and general fund. Kathy, is that right? 45%. You know what most mainland institutions get? Our aspirational peers and such? In the low teens, some of them are 8 or 9%. Okay? So we're sitting in a pretty good spot. Yeah, there are challenges. We've got funding is certainly there. Our facilities, we've got to work on it. But these are not challenges that are any more unique than the folks on the other side of the ocean. I think they're very, very similar. In fact, we've got to you know, continually query them to see what the best practices are on capitalizing on the opportunities that we've got as well in, in thinking of how we address those challenges. 